as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Continue to live, in some of your translations may say continue to walk in him, which means uh, the same thing, live your lives that way. Um, but it says, just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, um, we receive, when we become believers, we receive not only the doctrine, which is the truth about Jesus, but we, we receive him personally as well. Uh, we receive him into our hearts, into our lives, uh, to affect us. So, salvation is not merely um, believing and agreeing with the facts about Jesus. It means personally embracing him as your Lord of your life. Um, all that, I think, is part of uh, what the Bible will call faith, or saving faith. Um, I think there's too many people who have the impression that as long as I agree with the facts of the gospel, I'm saved, and I can basically live like I want. I don't have to have a relationship with Jesus. I just I acknowledge, uh, I acknowledge it. You give mental assent to it. Uh, but that is not what the Bible describes as saving faith. Uh, just right here, Paul says that you receive Jesus. Uh, he becomes the Lord of your life. So, uh, so that we continue, the NIV says, to live your lives in Him. That means to continually, constantly, habitually live with Jesus so that He has a constant effect on what you do. He, he is in your life completely. Um, and then uh, he goes on in verse 7 and says, Rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So what's kind of cool about this, and, and I'm going to say this is now, we're going to go to seminary level stuff, and every once in a while I do this. Um, so if, like the grammar, you, you don't, uh, you know, tune in on the grammar, that's okay. Um, but I really feel like um, it's worth talking about, uh, because what Paul is doing here in the grammar in the Greek is very, very interesting. Um, he says, live your lives in him. And then what he's going to do in verse 7 is give us examples of what that looks like. So what I just read is, is what it means to live your life in Him. It means being um, rooted and built up and strengthened and overflowing with thankfulness. And in the Greek, those are four participles. And participles in Greek are kind of unusual. They're really long, and they, uh, they, they kind of have the same ending. So it kind of stands out when you read it in the original language. Uh, so these four participles Paul uses to describe what it means to live in Him, in Christ. And the first one that we'll look at is uh, rooted. Um, in English, if you wanted to translate that as kind of a parcel, you'd say being rooted, I guess would be, would be the way to translate that. Um, we are rooted, um, which is an event that happens um, once we, are, uh, we come to know the Lord, and then we are rooted in our relationship and in our faith. Now, further uh, grammar. Um, each one of these participles is, is interesting because the first one is in a perfect tense and the last three are in the present tense. Let me explain what that means. Uh, the present tense in Greek refers to something that happened in the past but has ongoing effects into the future. Okay, And so what Paul does is the first word rooted he talks about as happening in the past with ongoing effects and the next three participles explain what the present effects are. They're in the present tense. So we're rooted, which is something that's happened in the past with ongoing effects. We got rooted in him. Well, what are the effects of being rooted? Being built up, strengthened, and overflowing with thanksgiving. Those are the things that, are, that we should be doing now, now that we're rooted. Okay. So the first one is being strengthened, or um, excuse me, built up in him, as the NIV says. Being built up is the first one. Uh, what does it mean to be built up in him, in Jesus? Uh, well, I think it means that the relationship we have with Jesus is growing, improving, deepening. He's having more and more of an effect on your life. You're being built up in Him. And the second one is strengthened. Or some of your translations, depending on what you have, might say being established. Uh, or strengthened. Is, either one is, is fine. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, we are, uh, he, Paul writes, we are strengthened in the faith as you were taught, um, as you were taught, knowledge of doctrine. I mean, part of our faith is knowing the truth that is revealed in the Word of God. Uh, it has to, not only do we know it, but it has to become more and more relevant to you as you live your life. And I think that's one of the things we want to do is be able to read the Bible 
and have it be relevant to our lives. Uh, the Bible was written a very long time ago, right? A couple of thousand years ago. And so the tendency for some people is to say, well, <laughs> 2,000 years ago, that's a pretty long time ago. What does that really have to say for me right now? Well, it turns out when you read the Bible, um, the, the truth is timeless, is literally timeless. Uh, what was true for people then are tr is true for people now. Okay, so, can I say something funny? The, I was having lunch with some colleagues this week, and they're like, what's the deal with this? Like, once you read the Bible once, like, why do you have to keep reading it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, trying to explain yeah, that concept yes. was just, like, they listened politely. I'm not sure how much they took with that, but it was yeah. just, I don't get it. You right. read it once. Why, why do you have to keep reading it? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, my mother uh, loves to read novels, and, I mean, she has just shelves of novels that she's read. And uh, I've often wondered why she keeps the novels, because once you've read it, I mean, what's the point of going back and reading it again? You kind of know what's going to happen in the end. So yeah, people, I think, approach the Bible the same way. You know, why, why read it again? You, you already know what's in there. But that's the, you know, the whole point is to be shaped, is to be formed by what it says. It has the power to do that. And so uh, by uh, constantly reading it and studying it, I know, I think, Don, you and I were talking one time, and... And Don was sharing with me, Don has been a Christian for uh, longer than most of us have been alive. <laughs> so uh, he was just sharing one time that, you know, reading the Bible, um, you, you, he was constantly finding, I think you put it, new gold nuggets in, in the scriptures. You know, brand new ones that you hadn't seen before. And, and that's what it does. It has the power. It's that deep to constantly be finding new truth in it. So it really is, uh, it really has that power because it is from God. It is, it is his word. Um... And then the final uh, kind of participle that talks about what it means to be rooted is to be overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing. Not just to have thankfulness, right? But to be overflowing with it. That really should be a major part of uh, who we are, what we do, what we say. Our whole thinking should be in terms of thankfulness for what uh, God has done for us. Uh, Without being thankful, we show that we truly do not understand what Jesus has done for us. I mean, unless you are just unbelievably thankful, I don't think you recognize all that he's done. Because when you do, you know, what other response can you possibly have except just to say, thank you, Lord, I just can't believe what you've done. Um, we really owe him that in a, in a constant way. And so uh, Paul says we should be constantly thankful, uh, and that we should be overflowing with that thankfulness. That really would um, is the appropriate response to what Jesus has done. Well, then in verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Just as a side note, this passage is, a, is difficult. Um, when you read the commentaries, Paul uses some unusual language in this passage, and so there's always a lot of discussion. Um, but uh, we'll do the, the best that we can to uh, understand it. But Paul begins in verse 8, see to it, see to it. Uh, a much better translation, if anybody has like the King James or the NASB. Uh, Kathy, you have a new American, how does verse 8 go? See to it that no one oh, takes you captive okay. through philosophy and empty deception. Uh, that's good. Um, the uh, King James says, be, uses the word beware. Beware that no one takes you captive. That's actually a much better trans translation of the word. Because when it comes to the word captive, see to it no one takes you captive. Um, that's a word that uh, does not refer to... Um, captives like uh, when an army comes in and takes you captive. It's not talking about that. What that word was used for in Greek was for kidnapping. It was used for kidnapping. It was used for what they would call man-stealing a lot of times. Uh, when you are forcefully taken to become enslaved to somebody else um, by kidnap. That's, that's really what that means. And so Paul is saying that that, kind of, that can happen to you mentally, intellectually. If you're not careful, you can be taken, you can be kidnapped by what? By hollow and deceptive philosophy. Hollow and deceptive philosophy. Paul is not condemning all philosophy, believe me, right? He's condemning what is hollow and deceptive, false philosophy. Um, I, uh, I 
have a background in philosophy and I, uh, I like it and I like it a lot. And there are many Christian philosophers who have done enormous good in this world. And uh, I know C.S. Lewis, uh, who didn't call himself a philosopher, but that's exactly what he was. And, but he, he said, um, the world needs good philosophy if for no other reason than to answer bad philosophy. <laughs> so, and he's, he's right, you know, we do, Paul, we do need that. And so Paul is not condemning good philosophy by any means, but it's the hollow and deceptive kinds of philosophies that, um, that we see not only in Paul's time, but actually on, in our time as well. And Paul goes on to say it's philosophy that depends on human tradition. Uh, human tradition. In, um, that was particularly deceptive in this first century because in the first century, old was better than new. But something that was old was tried and true. Uh, it was tested. It was established. Today, I think we have it. Today, kind of the new improved is always, you know, what's better. You know, labels on everything you buy in the store, new and improved, you know. And uh, so today, the kind of the newer, the better. Uh, but in, in Paul's day, the older, the better. The more traditional, the better. And uh, so Paul is saying that some of this false philosophy looks really good. And, and it can be really deceptive because it depends on tradition. And uh, that's been tested and true. And so it's easy to be fooled by that. We have to be really, really careful. And then he says it also depends on the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now, um, that's really uh, an interpretation of the Greek because in the NIV they have a footnote and they have a, a more literal translation in the footnote which is the basic principles of the world, the basic principles. Um, I would agree with the scholars who would say the NIV has this wrong in their main translation because it, it does refer to the basic principles of the world. So what Paul is saying that this false philosophy depends on human tradition and basic principles. And I think those two things are equivalent uh, when Paul, they're parallel when Paul is speaking about that. So I think um, the best way to understand this is, and again, the King James is good because it talks about the rudimentary, or the rudiments of the world. Uh, basically, it's the basic systems of human thought. It's human ideology, if you will. That's what Paul is saying, that human ideologies, human thought systems, can be deceptive, uh, and so don't let your mind get kidnapped by these, or don't be carried away with them, because they're all false, they're all wrong. Uh, be really, really careful. And it's true today. Uh, we can. There's so many <laughs> different belief systems, there's so many different philosophies that are swirling around now in the world, and um, very, very few of them are any good. Uh, I mean, what makes it good is if Christ is in the middle of it. Uh, but all these worldly philosophies and traditions, especially all this, there's so much self-help stuff out there. Uh, there's these self-help gurus. A lot of times they're on the PBS channels, you know, you see them lecturing and talking. And, man, they look really authoritative. They look like they know what they're saying. But if you listen to them, it's totally devoid of any spiritual truth. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very uh, humanistic, uh, what we can accomplish on our own. And there's no mention of God. And so... Um, we just need to be careful. People can get sucked into that if they're not, if they're not careful. Well, in verse 9, Paul writes, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. For. Um, now, what this kind of links to the previous verse, and it's easy to miss that. That word for, you know, is links, links it. Uh, so what Paul is saying is that hollow and deceptive philosophies that are humanistic and you know, based on human tradition, are bad because Jesus has all the fullness of God. So if it's not about Jesus, then you're missing the whole point in philosophy and in life, all right? So uh, it really is all about Jesus. That's when it comes to our philosophy of life, it has to be about Jesus because he's literally God on earth. So many people today, you know, man, if I could only talk to God, if God could just appear to me right now and I could talk to him, well, you know, he did in, in, in Jesus, and people did get a chance to talk to him, and we have uh, what God said written in the Gospels. And so, um, you know, that's, it is really all about Jesus. Uh, so Jesus is clearly distinguished from the, the human world here that is just mentioned. Uh, Jesus was in the world, but he wasn't of the world. He had all the fullness of deity living in him. The fullness makes Christ above Christ. 
every human or spiritual or angelic being because he is the fullness of deity, because Jesus is actually God. So when Paul says this, he's, he's actually, in this one sentence, he's refuting some, some uh, belief systems, which are very false. Um, there's, a, there's a system called um, docetism, which uh, believes, it's based on the Greek word uh, dokane, which means appearance, and uh, that, that philosophy says that Jesus just appeared to be human. He wasn't really uh, physical. He was, he was God, but he wasn't physical. Well, of course, that's not what the Bible teaches, right? Uh, the opposite heresy of that is called Arianism, that believes that Jesus was only human and was not divine. And uh, cults today, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, hold to that uh, belief. So uh, those are two major errors, errors that have been made throughout history, that Jesus either, either wasn't fully God, or he wasn't fully human, uh, but he was both, if you want to uh, be accurate and, and to uh, follow what the Bible actually teaches. So um, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus was on earth, human, just like us, but he was God at the same time, fully God. Um, and then in 10, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So in Christ, you have been brought to fullness now. So we have to really pause here for a second and understand this. If Paul says that in Christ all the, full, the fullness of the deity lives, and then we've been brought to fullness, does that mean we're deity? No. Good. I'm glad to hear you say no. Not quite. <laughs> not quite. Yeah, well, some, some closer than others, perhaps, but none of us quite make it. Uh, yes, that is correct. That is clearly not what Paul is saying, and that would be... Uh, of course, I suppose if you took this verse, and it was the only verse you ever read out of the Bible, you could probably conclude that. But uh, if you read the entire rest of the Bible... Uh, but actually, if you actually read the Greek, um, you would not conclude that either. Um, this uh, word, uh, fullness, is, um, when Paul says you've been brought to fullness, what he is saying is that you have been fulfilled in Christ. That's the most literal way, is that you have been fulfilled in him. Um, so we do not become deity as Christ did, but we are fulfilled in him. In other words, all of our needs are met in Christ. We're fulfilled, all of our, all of our needs. And, and in context, it's our spiritual needs. Every spiritual need that we have has been fulfilled when it comes to Jesus Christ. And so that uh, is an obvious reference to our salvation. Um, and in fact, what now is going to happen is that um, in the rest of the passage we're going to look at this morning, in the next uh, four verses, 11, 12, 13, and 14, um, even 15, Paul is going to describe how it is that we have been fulfilled, how it is that our spiritual needs have been met. So it's kind of cool. You know, it's one of the ways that Paul writes is he'll make a statement and then he'll spend a couple of verses elaborating on it. And, and, but you can miss it if you're not aware of that. So uh, he did that in verse 6 and 7, and now he's going to do it again. He makes this statement, then he's going to elaborate on it for several verses, which we'll look at in just a second. Um, but uh, this idea of uh, being fulfilled, only someone who has the power over every authority, like Jesus, Paul says, he, ha he is the head over every power and authority. In other words, he is superior to every power and authority. Only someone like that could fulfill our spiritual needs. All right? He's deity. He's the head over every power and authority. He's qualified. To, to save us. He's qualified to fulfill every need that we have because of who he is. So Paul is basically asking, I think, um, why would you need anything else? Why would you need anybody else? Why would you need any other belief system? All the human philosophies of the world that, that depend on tradition, why do you need them if, if Jesus is there? He's the one who's totally qualified to save you. Don't need anything else. Why do you bother with other belief systems? And the, one of the really deceiving things that we that we have seen today, and, and in a sense throughout history, but really today a lot, is that some belief systems actually see Jesus as positive, as good, but not God. The Muslims would be a good example, quite honestly. They, Jesus is a prophet, you know, for them. In fact, he's an awfully special prophet in their eyes. 
Um, but he's not God. That would be, for the Muslim, that's blasphemy, right? Um, there are cults today that, uh, that say Jesus is, uh, was a great moral teacher. The uh, Unitarian Universalist Church, uh, they teach that Jesus was maybe the greatest moral teacher of all time. But he was just a man. He was just human. <coughs> they call it a church. <laughs> I don't, they don't really worship Jesus, you know. Um, but uh, you got to be really, really careful. It's so easy for people to say uh, that Jesus was a great moral teacher. I remember when I was first, I don't know what the, getting saved. I, I was reading a, a book. I, I got saved by reading uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And um, one of the things that really struck me as I was reading through that book, uh, Lewis said that so many people see Jesus as a great moral teacher. And I said, yeah, because I kind of was looking at him that way, you know, for my life. Uh, and Lewis said, well, that's the one thing that he could not possibly be. And I said, what? You know, come on, look at his teaching. I mean, he's so moral. He looks like the greatest moral teacher. And Lewis is saying that he could not possibly be that. And then Lewis goes on to explain and says that uh, if you look at exactly what Jesus taught, he claimed to be God. Now, that either makes him a liar, it makes him a lunatic, or he's telling the truth. Now, if he's a liar, he can't be a great moral teacher. He's a liar. That's the opposite of being a moral teacher. If he's a lunatic, well, he's mad. He couldn't possibly be a good moral teacher if he's insane. The only option left is that he was telling the truth. And he was telling the truth, and that's what made him a good moral teacher. That he was telling the truth about who he was. He was God. And that's what so many people, uh, they leave out. They, they omit. They don't, um, you know, they're, they're willing to say he's a good moral teacher, but that's it. But that's the one thing he could never have been. Uh, so I'd, uh, Lewis was just clever that way. But uh, uh, the question to approach then, anytime you know, there's a belief system, anytime uh, something looks attractive to you, ask the question, is Jesus preeminent in that teaching? Is Jesus God? Man, fully man, fully God. Uh, if that is how Jesus is treated, then uh, you can read more. <laughs> you know? But unless that's true, uh, walk away. You know, don't be sucked in, don't be fooled. Um, it's just not going to be true. So, um, going on from that, uh, like I said, Paul makes this statement, um, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. You have been fulfilled in him. So, how is it that we have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ? Okay, here's where Paul starts. Number 11, he says, first of all, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole, uh, your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. So we have to say, what's he talking about here? What's this business about circumcision? Um, the Bible teaches us that um, all Christians are circumcised in their heart and by by that, the expression means that our, our sinful flesh is cut off and removed from us. The sinful flesh is cut off and removed. Now this is speaking positionally. In other words, this is our position before Christ, is that our sin has been removed because of what Jesus has done. And so Paul is using circumcision as an illustration of how our sinful flesh has been removed. Um, Romans, he, Paul uh, talks about this more directly in Romans uh, chapter 2. Let me just uh, read that for you very quickly. Romans 2 verses um, 28 and 29. Paul writes this, A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. So, Paul is saying that a true Jew, or a true person of God, has been circumcised in the heart. In other words, God has done something in your heart. He has uh, changed you. He has removed your sinful um, culpability, your sinful flesh, and he's uh, made you pure. So, uh, Paul says, and, he, and he's illustrating this by his, his language, he says uh, that the self ruled by the flesh was put off, was put off, that is to be totally stripped away, totally removed, completely 
removed. Uh, there's a, a, a total removal of <coughs> sin. And it's interesting because he brings up circumcision, which was part of the Old Testament law. Every uh, baby boy was circumcised on the eighth day. Um, and, and Paul is basically saying, well, that, that does no good. All right? That's, that kind of circumcision doesn't do a thing to save you. What saves you is the circumcision that God performs in your heart when he separates sin from you. That is what saves you. And that's why Paul says that being a, a Jew, a true Jew, if you will, a true uh, uh, person of God, uh, requires this circumcision of the heart. And um, that is what Jesus has done for us. And what Jesus has done is, is all we really need. Um, totally um, saves us from that. And it's uh, kind of understand because we can only love God properly if this is done. Even the, the, uh, the Old Testament taught that. And why the Jews kind of miss this a lot of times, I'm not really sure. But in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, here's what uh, Moses wrote. He said this, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. God is going to circumcise your hearts so that you may love him with all your heart. In other words, we can't love God with all our hearts until this happens. Until Jesus comes into our lives, circumcises the sinful flesh away, we, you really can't love God even. Uh, no one will turn to God unless he comes in and does a work in your, in your heart first. Um, so salvation is not merely the forgiveness of sins. Um, it's going to change your life. Um, it's going to purify you. It's going to allow you to love God in the way that, that we should. Um, so Paul goes on in verse uh, 12. Now he's going to use a different metaphor. First he uses the metaphor of circumcision. And now he's going to use one. Uh, baptism. This is the second way that uh, we've been brought to fulfillment in Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So Paul says well, that we, um, we, were we were buried with him in baptism. <clears throat> now when, when you go to a baptism, we're having baptism next month, I think, right? A baptism yeah. service? Um, Who's been to that? Who go? Okay, most of you. You should go because it's really a lot of fun. Uh, you see people uh, really expressing what God has already done in their hearts, and, and it's really a, a wonderful time. But there's a lot of symbolism in, in the baptism, right? Because what happens is the person goes completely under the water, and that symbolizes us being buried with Jesus Christ, our identification with what Jesus did on the cross. You remember, He represented us on the cross. And so there's an identification now that we have as him as our representative. And so um, baptism symbolizes that. When you go under the water, you are, but Jesus was buried in the tomb, totally, completely dead. That's us under the water. Not for three days, thankfully. <laughs> Jesus was in the tomb <laughs> uh, momentarily, not even three seconds, you know. Uh, so we go, but we do go under. And, and that's why the symbolism of our kind of baptism is good. People baptize in a lot of different ways. Some churches pour water over the head. Some churches sprinkle water on you. But, but the fact that you go into the water really uh, brings out the symbolism that it's intended. It's, it's being buried with Christ. So you go completely under the water, just like Christ is completely in the, in the tomb. Then you come out of the water. And so Paul says that you were also raised with him. And that symbolizes Christ rising from the dead, coming out of the tomb three days later. And so we come out of the water identifying with Christ um, to a new life. Um, so baptism symbolizes, again, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. That's how we're fulfilled. Our spiritual needs are fulfilled in Christ because we identify with his death and with his resurrection. Now, this does symbolize baptism, but is Paul saying that baptism really saves us? No. No, because what's the next phrase? Through your faith, right? Mm -hmm. We're, raised, we're, baptized, we're buried with him in baptism and raised with him through faith, right? It's faith that makes everything effective. We are saved by, by faith. Faith is the vehicle by which God imparts his saving work to us. Uh, so it's not the physical act of being saved. It's the act of 
of faith. It's the act of believing. That is what is uh, needed in order to be saved. Uh, so uh, we have faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. God raised Jesus from the dead. He raised us from spiritual death. So uh, it is God and Jesus has the fullness of God. So you can put it all together and uh, God is the one who has done the saving work in our, in our life. Then in uh, verse 13, um, Paul puts it kind of a, a different way. He says that we were made alive. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, all right, that means you were separated from God, living a totally sinful life, um, totally alienated from God. What did God do? Made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins. God made you alive. We have spiritual life. Um, we now, because of what God has done in our hearts, we can actually choose to obey God. And that's actual, that's real freedom, you know. Prior, when you're enslaved, when Paul talks about being dead in your sins, you really don't know what freedom is. And people who do not have Jesus, who live their life, they feel like they're free. I'm free to do anything I want, right? They have this sense of freedom, but they're actually not free. They're enslaved because of their sinful nature. They will never turn to God. They will never choose to obey God. They're not free to do that. They're only free to pursue their own passions and, and desires. When God comes in and touches your heart, then you have freedom. That's why Jesus talks about, you know, being free. Um, freedom is the ability to choose to obey. Uh, again, back in Romans uh, chapter 6, um, Paul in verses 11 and 12, Paul writes this. Um, he says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. So, in other words, he's saying, Don't let it happen. You now have the power, you now have the freedom to turn away from sin. You're no longer dead in your sins. You're no longer captive to that power. But Jesus has freed us from that. We have the ability to choose now to obey God. That's a, a choice you don't have when you're dead in your sins. So it's because God has made us alive that we now have a true freedom and we can choose to obey Him. And Paul says that, uh, furthermore, He forgave us all our sins. <coughs> He forgave us all our sins. There's no longer anything that alienates us from God. Um, we have gone from death to life. Uh, our sins have been forgiven. And uh, we now, you know, are, are saved. Um, then in 14, another illustration. Another illustration. He writes, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, Nailing it to the cross. The NIV has really gone out of its way in this new in the 2011 edition to uh, try and explain to us the words that Paul is using here. Uh, in some of your translations, you might have uh, the words "written code." He has canceled the the written code. Anybody have that in their Bibles? If you have a different yeah. translation, what are you reading from? The older NIV. The older, older NIV. NIV. Okay, the the written code. Um, the reason the NIV, NIV made such a change is because um, uh, it's easy to misunderstand this term written code, and there's so much discussion about this. Um, but a lot of people thought when it says, in your, in your, the old NIV said, the written code with its regulations. Yeah. Okay? And people said, oh, well, that's an obvious reference to the Old Testament law, the written code with all its uh, regulations. And, um, but all, the, the majority of scholars today would just simply disagree with that because the word that Paul uses here, written code, it's the only time this word occurs in the entire Bible. And it's not a, a word that referred to the Old Testament law at all. Uh, what that referred to was in the first century, uh, it was the equivalent of an IOU. You know, everybody know what an IOU is? Mm -hmm. If you owe somebody some money, right, then you, you actually make that statement, I owe you $1,000 and you sign your name saying that you are in this person's debt, you give it to them, and, and they can call that debt in. 
right? Because you, you have admitted that you owe that money. But it's something that you write. And the, the word written code uh, in Greek means handwriting. It's the handwriting. It's the handwritten note, the IOU. Now the problem is that the Old Testament law wasn't written by us, it was written by God. See, and so that's why so many scholars think, well, this is not really talking about the Old Testament law. What it's saying is that when you become a believer, you now are obligated to obey Christ perfectly in everything you do. And so you write this IOU, it says, IOU perfect obedience, Lord, your son, your name. Now what happens? Do you fulfill that? No. Hardly, <laughs> right? Hardly. I can remember when I was baptized, and I, I was just so like, this is so cool. I never want to sin again. And by the time I went to bed that night, <laughs> I, I had things to confess, right? So we, we, we totally mess up. We are unable to fulfill what we owe God. We owe Him perfection. That's what He demands. But we've completely failed. And so when Paul, uh, Paul is talking about this kind of a note, so he writes, we have canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. In other words, we are legally, there's a legal sense here, that we're legally obligated to follow the will of God. And if we violate it, death penalty. It's like committing a capital crime. So you sin, you die. We have sinned, we deserve death. So that IOU stands against us. That, that commitment that we made, we have, it's completely failed. But now that we failed, God's still holding it, going, you owe me. You owe me your life now, okay? So, if that's the case, what God has done is he's canceled it. He's canceled it. Um, the word, uh, and then uh, I think in the old NIV it says, oh, later on it says he has taken it away. He has taken it away. That means to be fully erased. Fully erased. The IOU that we wrote that was convicting us, he erases it. And you know how he erased it? Nailed it to the cross. Uh, they believe that um, in the first century, when a criminal was convicted, the criminal was then uh, crucified for, for, for a penalty that required death. And what they would do is that they would take the charges that were brought against the criminal and they would put it, they would nail it to the cross over his head. Does that sound familiar with something that happened yeah. to Jesus? Yeah. See, in John 19, uh, let me just go there. Because the, it was, apparently this was not unique to Jesus. We, we think that, oh, you know, this, this happened to Jesus. But apparently this is what happened to each criminal who was sentenced to death and, and who was executed this way. Um, so in John... Uh, 19, uh, 19, it says, uh, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You remember, that's what he was accused of. Uh, he was claiming that he was king. That was the charge of treason that was brought against him because the Jews realized that um, just because Jesus claimed to be God, the Romans didn't care if he claimed to be God, you know, and the Jews had a problem with that. The Jews had to come up with some sort of crime that the Romans would find him guilty of. And that was treason, see? So the, the Jews got, got smart and they said, well, well wait a minute, he's, he's claiming to be king. He's claiming to be what Caesar is. Now that, that's a crime, you know, that's a big crime in Rome, claiming to be king. You don't claim to be king, Caesar is the sovereign, he is king. You saying you're king? Yeah, you're trying to dethrone Caesar? That, that's treason, that's a death penalty. And so that was the charge that really was brought against Jesus. And so Pilate has this note, and he says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And it's almost in a, obviously, a mocking, he's, he's uh, being satiric, you know, he's, he's saying, Jesus claimed to be king, here's what happens to people who claim to be king, right? He's some king. Uh, but that was really the message there. Uh, and it says, many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that this man only claimed to be king of the Jews. So what happened was this sign was put up that, of his uh, accusation, and, and the, the Jews said, well, that might be misinterpreted. You know, they might say he really, he really is, and he's going to get some more converts. We don't want that, you know. And Pilate said, too bad. You know, what I've written, I have written. 
So um, that's the practice that apparently uh, was going on in the first century, that criminal had the charges up against him showing what he was guilty of. And so uh, what Paul is saying in this verse is that what got nailed to the cross was that IOU that we wrote to God. It got nailed to the cross. It got erased, done away with. Jesus dying on the cross uh, was what erased that IOU. So now there's no longer anything to charge us guilty of. It's been gone. It's been taken away. So that's another way that uh, Jesus has uh, fulfilled all of our, all of our needs. Um, then in verse 15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public, a, public, a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So um, it says, this is the final illustration of how we've been fulfilled in Christ. He's disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public, public, keep saying public, I should coin a new word, Paul did that sometimes, public, public, public display, a public spectacle of them. Um, to disarm, he says he disarmed them. Um, that was a, a military term in the first century, people would recognize that, um, as being uh, what the um, conquering army did for, uh, to the enemies, uh, strip them of their weapons. Uh, after they were defeated, right? When, a, when an army surrenders, uh, you go in and what do you do? The first thing you do is you take their weapons away. Um, that's, uh, that's just what you do. And so uh, that's what Paul is saying, that these uh, powers and authorities have been stripped of their weapons, stripped of their, their power. Uh, what are the powers and authorities? Well, that's a little bit unclear. Do you have a question? I wonder if that's referring to neither neither death nor hell, either you know, powers nor authorities can separate us from the love of God. Is that what he's talking about there? Yeah, it could be. Because verses do connect to each other. Yeah, um, uh, it's possible. It, it's a little bit unclear, but I, to me, uh, it's probably uh, maybe inclusive of all power and all authorities, whether it's uh, heavenly or, or on earth. Uh, demonic beings could be Rome, the power of Rome, angels. Um, who, whatever it is, Christ has disarmed and conquered any embodiment of evil and rebellion. And um, then he says he made a public spectacle of, uh, of them, triumphing over them. Now this public spectacle was also a word that um, had to do with, with that. Usually what Rome did, Rome, you know, their empire was always expanding. They were always conquering uh, new people. And, uh, whenever an army was stupid enough to try and stand up to the uh, Roman legions, they, they would get defeated, and then what Rome would do would be to take the, um, the, the armies and uh, bring them back to Rome and parade the defeated army, especially the generals, uh, in front of everybody, making a public spectacle of them. It was really a public parade where Rome would take the most powerful, the highest ranking uh, soldiers and parade them through town in a very humiliating way. They would be chained, um, they, would be, uh, they would just be humiliated publicly uh, for having stood up against Rome. Uh, it was a sign of total defeat, total conquering, uh, rendering your enemy totally powerless. And so that is the illustration now that Paul is saying that, that Jesus did when he was on the cross. He, he totally defeated every evil power and authority that exists. And he made a public spectacle of them. He, it's like he was parading them in humility. And so he, uh, he totally, um, totally conquered them. And he triumphed over them by the cross. And so uh, it, all of this happened on the cross when Jesus uh, died. Um, this is all the effect that we have uh, from what Jesus did. Um, so, uh, God, um, God has served to uh, work to save us through Jesus. And uh, in all these different ways, Paul's trying to illustrate how we are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, all of our spiritual needs have been fulfilled in all these ways, are just kind of different creative ways at, at understanding what Jesus has done. And, and I think it's helpful because when we, 
we look at all these different things that God has done, all these different ways that he saved us, uh, it just gives us a fuller understanding and appreciation for all that he did. And so that's why, again, Paul says in the beginning that we should be overflowing with thankfulness. That should, that should describe your demeanor towards Jesus like all the time, all the time, just constantly uh, he saved us. I often think, some, I saw this, um, there was a military hero, you know, the highest um, military honor that someone can get is the Medal of Honor that, that a soldier can receive. That's the highest, and it's very, very rare uh, that it's given out, and it's almost always given out to someone who, who is dead because they gave their lives uh, trying to save and are saving uh, their fellow soldiers. And so, um, I it was about t two years ago or so, uh, I saw on television this guy who had won the Medal of Honor, he's still alive, over in Iraq, or Afghanistan, I guess. And um, he, uh, he was in very bad shape. Um, his face was disfigured. He, he had a very difficult time walking. Because what happened was he and, he and about five of his friends were up on a rooftop, and um, they were being attacked by, um, by uh, ISIS or whoever it was. And they were really outnumbered, and it was really getting bad. And, uh, but they were up there defending themselves, and a hand grenade came and landed where they were. And so this guy dove on top of it, and it exploded. Somehow he survived, but he was in really, really bad shape. Um, they were able to uh, somehow, <laughs> see, you know, miraculously, somehow get him out of there, got him to help, and he survived. And he's had like 20 surgeries, you know, in the, in the mm. meantime. But um, he did that. He, and, he, and by doing that, he actually saved the lives of his teammates, of, his, mm. of the guys who were near him. So I think today, how about those guys? You know, what, what do they say to him when they see him? Mm. How, do they, how do they feel towards him? Man, you saved my life. I owe you. Like, I'm alive today. You know, I, I, I shouldn't even be here, but I am because of the sacrifice that you made. And, and man, he's paying for it the rest of his life because he's, he's physically really, really bad off now. So how do, you, how do they respond to him? How do they deal with him? Every time they see him, what do you think their emotions would be? Thank you. Yeah. They would be overflowing with thankfulness. And really, that's what Jesus did for us. We, we don't often think of it in those terms, but that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He gave his life for us. He rose again, so he's alive now. And uh, we ought to be as thankful to him as those guys are thankful to his, their friend who threw himself on the hand grenade. Um, that, is, that is what Jesus has done for us. And so, uh, so hopefully, um, this, this is a powerful passage that I, that I hope uh, helps us appreciate more. Of what Jesus has done. Any uh, thoughts or, or questions? Okay, then let me pray and we will go on into church. <laughs>